and we welcome you back to the Detroit Garden Center's Winter Seminar for 2021. Uh, we're visualizing change in the garden landscape and now we're moving into chapter two, which is the techniques for visualizing what you want to do in these places that we've been focusing on in, in chapter one. The outline is, that we're following along and I'm showing you as we go along is in is at gardenazine.org in the webinars section under conference materials. So I say, let's visualize some space and the change at this point. And this is where, boy, it's nice when it's a blank slate to work with. So this became a blank slate at this house because um, they said, oh, we're just old, 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 old. It had a straight walk about 18 inches wide that went across the front. So this is a new curved walkway that we drew out and it's just been put in the side where it was taken out. Um, we took out all the shrubs. So it's a blank slate. It's easy to visualize something like this. And on your outline, you've got that visualized. Literally a piece of tracing paper put on top and just not, you're not trying to be exact. You're not trying to be an artist. You're just tracing the lines that you can see through the, through the graph paper. Can you see that there? It's not exactly the same. It's close though. And what that does is it lets you work on adding other focal points and lines and elements that you can add in just as a kindergarten fashion as drawing that house. You can add a tree that has a mushroom type shape to it. You can add something pyramidal. You can add something upright. You can add something that has more of a vase shape to it or more of a mound. You can just pencil those things in in various places to look at them. So I, I looked at it and we did, Shirley and Steve, um, Shirley and Steve lived in this house at the time. And Shirley and Steve and I looked at it together. I said, well, front doors are almost always a focal point and we've made it more of a focal point by putting a big sweep of a walk to it. That's very welcoming. Your front door from your street and the end of your driveway doesn't show up all that well because it's tucked back into a recessed area. So let's make sure that the walkway stands out. Let's put your focal point out into the yard here and here and so that we're looking through it. Let's put something here and I don't know what it is yet. Something kind of medium coarse in texture and, and mounded with something upright and something coarse textured as a ground cover. That would work and maybe something mounded with something upright over here and that would keep us looking between the goal posts here toward the front door. Or we could just put something out in the front that uh, we just do something easy. We'll put a round headed tree or a round headed woody plant with something spreading on the ground below it. What we ended up doing was leaving the walkway visible and some grass, some uh, lawn in that area and putting evergreens surrounding a vase shaped or um, what we hoped would be a vase shaped Hydrangea. Hydrangea, as years went by, this was all, oh, I don't know, five or six or seven years later, needs some pruning because it's lost its base shape. It's become a mound. But we put attention here and here. A mounded tree, which when we first put it in, this is a golden rain tree, when we first put it in, it was quite small. So in order to take its place temporarily, we put in an upright grass. By the time the tree got big enough, Shirley and Steve were so attached to the grass that we had to leave it in, they wouldn't take it out. But um, so we have a mound on one side and on the other side a vase. And we used yellow, yellow foliage in the false cypress that's here. That's a gold fan false cypress. And these, these are seed pods now that are a yellowy green, but they were yellow flowers earlier to just kind of keep the attention on the front door. So an island here, not out by the road, but uh, it's a little ways from the walkway. So that it keeps the attention there. And when it was little, there was a little guy right there. Uh, you can, you can um, think, oh, I, I can't do that. It's, it, I can't draw well. You, you don't have to draw well. You can take a picture and trace it. And you don't have to trace it exactly. I'm, help, girl. I'm helping a client um, imagine what's going on, what could go on in her backyard. If it's, you're looking out the deck and you're looking down your deck and across the lawn across the lawn, if we put your cabana storage facility, it's a little storage, a little uh, storage shed with a, a deck on top. If we put it in the middle, we can make it look like this. And 
what those things are, something mounted over here, something lower over here. We don't have what they are yet. We're just imagining what it looks like. Or we could put it off to one side and we could put a mounted, maybe a mounted tree here with something on either side of it and have our attention wander back this way a little differently. There's no art, there's no artistry there. It's not real. Um, and you can do these things pretty quickly if you put a piece of tracing paper over it. If you've got a picture, well, we'll do, we'll do, we'll show you exactly how to do that a little bit later, but you can, in just a couple of minutes time, put shapes into a picture and figure out where you might like to see them. So this is the big tree is in the neighbor's yard. The little tree is drawn here to say something about this big surrounded with your cabana and here's the entrance to your walkway right there. A lot of times you don't have a real good background to look at. You just, all you can look at is, is say, I'm not sure what I want to do out here. Um, Irene and Jack weren't sure just what they wanted to do, but they wanted to develop the area into something. There's just uh, autumn olive and, and honeysuckle growing underneath some black cherries and oaks in the back part of their yard. You know, what do we want to do? So, well, let's look at it from your porch. So we're looking at it from the porch and let's strip the color out of it. Let's just look at what the lines are. You've got a lot of vertical lines in there and you've got a lot of fuzz and haze in the texture of these plants being pretty much the same all the way through. So let's focus what, on what we see. Now the difference you see between these two pictures is we're now looking between these two rather than looking at this broad picture because from the porch, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way on my clicker. From the porch, this is the angle that you see and these are the two main, main players. So looking at that, I said, well, that's what we see. Um, and it would be kind of nice if we could draw the eye and, and look just in this middle area here, if there's enough light in between those trees, we could grow quite a number of different kinds of plants in there. And we could put in things that have more texture, coarser texture than the honeysuckles and, and uh, autumn olives that are in there, things that have a coarser texture and more color of one kind or another. So we'll, let's draw the eye in and around a group of plants in the middle. Um, you can color them if you want. So they're just shaded in here, saying something with some color back here that's taller, something that's coarse in texture of several different shades in the front part here. And we could color them to say what color they turn in the fall. So these are witch hazels. These are uh, um, witch hazel, Jelena, that, Jelena witch hazel that turns orange in the fall and has orange flowers in the spring. Um, this is Chinese spice bush which are male and female, Michelle had asked me earlier. I, um, with Stephen, I've never looked at that and we've been searching around. There are a couple of named varieties that are, um, that are male, but trying to find a place for them is not good. <laughs> so you grow them for the color of the foliage in the fall and the color of the flowers in the spring and don't worry about the fact that they aren't gonna have fruit on them until you figure out a place that can, anyway, more than that. Uh, Arnold's Promise, witch hazel, blooms yellow and turns yellow in the, in the fall. And this is a red witch hazel, which at the time we didn't know the name of this one is Sprite is what we ended up putting in here. Um, so you're, you're saying coarse and some color and showing and placing them in between the trees that, are, that were there already. Um, so when we planted it, it looked like this when it was first planted, where the line and the arbor that we made out of all of the well, not all of, but we used a lot of the wood that we took out, the shrubs that were there. We used that wood to make this arbor to keep your eye going in that middle part. And things are growing up in there now. All the chisels are getting bigger. They're growing up and they're coarser in texture. I can see them, or I couldn't see the witch the uh, honeysuckles that were there before. I couldn't tell you when I first, when we first designed this, what these were going to be. I just said, you need something in there, some kind of sculpture. Um, I put in some wood that had galls on it, neat uh, irregularities in the trunk. Um, but the, uh, the owners commissioned some sculptures, so there's some sculpture in there drawing your attention. 
You can do the same thing if you draw a plan drawing, uh, a plan, a scale drawing for yourself. It's as if you're looking at your garden from above. If you just draw a line through the front, wherever, whatever is going to be the front for your viewer, and always try to think of a viewer. Try not to think of all the viewers all together at the same time. Front, middle, and back. If you draw a line through the front and say, well, it touches a couple of twos and a couple of fours, if you know what those are, you can just draw that shape um, a third of the way across the line and draw this shape the rest of the way across the line. So you can say, okay, there's my twos and there's my fours. And all you did was put a piece of paper over the plants you're thinking about putting in and, and scribble them out. And then you just take them and put them in together. So the front of the garden, the middle of the garden, the line passes through six, these irises through one, this cranberry with great big leaves on the bottom and fine baby's breath like top over to the side here to five to a uh, uh, gas plant and then over here to eight to some goat's beard. And then the back line, the only thing I can probably see from the main viewer looking through is I can see a little bit of the corner. I can see seven back there. And that's all that you're doing is drawing what you think you're going to see to figure out what you've got. I do this with photos most of the time. I take pictures, I walk around, and I take pictures from where I'm going to see it. I don't, I don't try to see more than I can see in one turn of the head. So you're not trying to get a panoramic view where they take those real long pictures. You, you can't see that whole panoramic view. I'm trying to look and say, what do I see from here to here? I'm gonna take a picture from there to there. And I'm gonna use that picture looking into the door at Sue's house. And I can take other pictures. This is a Kusa dogwood, stealing the, stealing the picture from Dow Gardens. I can cut out the dogwood and I can put it onto Sue's picture. This is the same thing that design programs, some design uh, programs do for you, where they let you select plants and put them into the picture. It's just sliding pictures in at different levels, foreground, midground, background, to say, what do I think? What will that look like there? Will that hide the fact that there's these two kind of ugly trunks of spruces dying back? That could look pretty nice there, a little grow there. You can move it around and play around with it. You can do it with things like playing with the idea of using the Cedar Rapids. Um, Cedar Rapids has an iconic sculpture that uh, sits in town. So, you know, that would be kind of cool to put something like that in your garden. And you don't even have to cut it out exactly. You can just say, what if I put it there? Or how about in the backyard? Let's put it there. No, let's put it over there. You can just play around and move them around. And if you cut them out, you can literally just move them around like the old, oh, um, what were those called? Color forms. Do you remember having those when you were a kid? They were pieces of plastic that you could put on and stick on yeah. and make different layers. Yeah, color forms. I do. Yeah. Uh, and you can get the pictures from your own neighborhood or even your own house. When I was working with Sue and, and uh, uh oh, isn't that terrible? When people pass away and I start, stop for you. Anyway, um, I said, you know, we can use these things elsewhere and you can just cut that picture out and use it to put them someplace else. And just cut the picture out, take a picture. Um, I looked at this other angle of Sue's front, front, not the front of Sue, it's a different Sue, front of her house, and said, you know, when I come in the driveway, I can't see the door for that tree. And as it turned out with the construction to put a new walkway in and some other changes being made to the house, the tree was gonna to have to go. I said, I'm gonna erase the tree and I'm just gonna draw some lines and say, wouldn't it be nice to follow a line? Just a nice leisurely path to the front door. It'd be nice and it funnels my attention toward the front door. I'd like to do that. And that's what I did with where I drew the beds was to make that line go to the front door. What's important, what's important is that nothing, I don't want something tall here. I want just ground cover there. There are barely little pieces planted in there. I don't want something tall here. I want, I want the viewer when they come in to get that view right to the door to know for sure where they're going right away. And I'd like it to be a leisurely view back and forth. What goes in there doesn't matter as long as that line stays apparent because the line is what you were visualizing. And these guys start out little. 
because they're hydrangea tardiva. And they're growing big, but they're where they're supposed to be. They're over there. They're not in this place here, which is just ground cover now. Same thing with looking from the street in. Um, you, you like to be able to see the front door. Um, I had a neighbor who one time fell and she broke something. I forgot what it was, but she dragged herself to her front door and got herself up far enough to wave at the front door. And people went by all day long waving back at, at her. <laughs> um, Poor lady. Yeah, it does It does happen that, that the people are, and are, uh, anyway, you do want people to see the front door and you do want to seem friendly. You don't want to hide your front door, but you might not want to be totally um, out in the open. So you might say, well, how about if I just leave an access to the front door, but I give space to cover. So I'm going to put some lower things here and here. So that looking into the front door now, the same way you can see the front door, but it's not like you're exposing the whole front of the house and they start out little and they're growing bigger. The front of the house was populated, is populated with a bunch of trees that are not in good shape. You can see all of the dead on the, on the spruces. Um, they're trying to come back, but they, they just, they're, they're kind of timing out for as old as they are and the kind of plant that they are. So this is something that I said, we have to pretend that those aren't there. Um, we can use them for right now, but we're gonna pretend they're not there. So they're limbed up taken the dead and the dying out and lend them up and we're growing under them until these things become big enough that we're seeing just what we put in. So they've gone around the trunks of the trees and replaced them with other things. These are those hydrangeas, the tardiva or late blooming panicle hydrangea that we saw from the driveway end a little while ago. And these our father gilla, dwarf father gilla. It's a suckering shrub that's meant to be a, a mass altogether and a flowering dogwood, which are growing up and beginning to reach out to each other. So that's taking photographs and cutting out things and putting them in place. Um, and you can do that with your own yard. You can take pictures from uh, magazines. You can, you can cut anything out and use it. You can also flag the site. Um, this is at the Detroit Zoo. Currently, this area is underneath the wolf exhibit, but it was our garden when we first got started there. Um, and we've cleared out the area that used to be all like you see back here in order to make um, a garden and flags are marking where we want attention to go. And we actually moved those around quite a bit. There were five of us digging and clearing when we made this and several times during the day, the flags were picked up from where I placed them on the tentative design and moved around a little bit because Lori got up and realized that this one needed to be shorter or over further, or Corey looked over and said that that one needs to be further over to the side. So we moved them around a little bit. Um, all it is is just a piece of paper on a stake that gets your attention so that you can look and say, yes, that's good. I, I can look there and focus on that and then shift my eyes and look over there. And that makes a nice background. So you can put flags out there. I used to use my kids when they were little, no longer anywhere near little, but the grandkids are about the right. When, when my kids were like three and four feet tall, they were perfect size to be a short shrub or a tall perennial. <laughs> and I could say, could you go stand out there for a minute while I run back in the kitchen and look out? I need them to see how it would look. And sometimes I would say, hold your hands up over, I need five feet. Um, or you can set wheelbarrows or coolers out there, but stakes work pretty well. They let you set the height and the attention getting. Uh, in fact, my kids got used to us doing this so that one, uh, at one point, my husband and I were deciding where to put a tree in our backyard, a, uh, a beech tree that we long talked about planting. And we put a flag out and talked about whether we put it there. And then I moved the flag and then Steve moved the flag. And every day I would come home from work and I'd look out the window and go, yeah, no, nah, not there. And we'd move it around a little bit. And one day I came home and I said, oh, I thought, I thought we'd settled on it being there. Steve said, well, we did. I said, well, why'd you move the flag? Well, <laughs> my son had gone out and moved the flag. He just wanted to see if we even noticed what was going on out there. So you can flag things. Uh, it doesn't look like much. 
sorry about that. But I was carrying a bucket full of little white flags that we were using in the garden out here. And I set it down to explain that maybe we could put a black gum right here in the low spot and make a bed across there. So we're looking from the end of the driveway across to the garden that has the witch hazels in it that I was showing you earlier. And now we're making an entrance to that garden. So we could do something here to use the water that's coming off of the driveway and we'll put a black gum that likes, wa likes water and we'll put it there. Now we've changed angles a little bit. I'm never remembering to take exactly the same angle. I often take the before pictures and Steve takes the afters. Um, but that black gum, that bed right there is right there. We've just scooched over a little bit, but there's the black gum, here's the bed, and now there's a walkway through the middle of it in order to go into that area. So you can flag and say, we move those flags around quite a bit during the day. We move them back further, we move them up closer, but we ended up with putting them there and said, okay, mark that spot. That's where we'll put the black gum. Black gum is a native tree, much like an oak, um, slow growing as it gets older and has this one that's called wildfire because the new foliage that is growing throughout the year tends to be a, a reddish orange color, which is the color that it turns late in the fall as well. And it's a tree that really appreciates a lot of water. And this driveway has a lot of water that comes off of it and a lot comes down to this, it's a low area that we can use water. So it was a good choice to put there. I'm going back to that um, focal point area that I showed you earlier where the master gardeners were meeting. So it is, it's the only green spot in front of the building and everybody's seeing it as they come in the driveway and up into the parking lot. And that flagpole is just, it's just right there. It's just drawing your attention. How about we do something here? Wouldn't that be a better place to get attention toward the building and not out in the middle of two street utility poles in the background and all the rest of that stuff? And if we made it something with a rounded wide top, we could hide some of the background and it would look prettier to have something like that there. And then you can flag it, or just pretend it's a flag because it's gonna be a digital flag right now. You could walk around and look at it from other angles and say, is that a good place to do it? Does that help? Yeah, that helps kind of cut down the, um, the visual dominance of the flagpole to have something that would cross the line at that point from different angles. So you can flag it and look at it. We decided to leave the, the use in. I, I don't have an after of this because I don't know whether the class ended up going out and planting or not. But we looked at the back of the use and saw that they were browned out on the back and realized that's from salt application on the sidewalk. Well, so those use are helping shield the garden from salt. So we'll leave those in. So we'll leave those use in along the back edge, the sidewalk edge, but we'll put something there where the flag was leave some space so we can walk along and prune the U's. And then we'll frame it, put something that looks good with it, and frame it once more with three somethings that look good with it, and maybe some ground cover to just fill space there. And that will keep the attention up here rather than to the pole. Um, sometimes flags are really important because it's hard to see an area um, and hard to tell what you're, you're looking at. This is a uh, down slope. So it, it's a hill that falls away from the house. And those are difficult places to deal with because you have to draw someone out into that area in order to have them see this view down the slope from the house. You don't see that. There's my tape measure right across here. I'm measuring this whole area. And imagine my friend Deb is there in red. Imagine her as a flag because we had a flag down there to mark that spot. And once we, uh, we put a tall enough flag there, we could see the tall flag from the house. So if we put something that was at least as tall as the flag, then we would have something that would be visible from the house and also visible from this angle. So then, so there she is. Then we decided, I decided and they agreed to put in a walkway from here down to that point. So we're looking at these two trees, this black cherry, and there's a, uh, uh, I think it's an oak down here. And we're standing at the top of the slope. And we're looking down and through those two trees and out to that area. And right there is where we put a uh, um, 
sweet bay magnolia, sweet bay, no, no, but a yellow magnolia right there that will have a, a tall enough crown and a coarse enough big leaf that against the background of all of this, this is the neighbor's autumn olive and other kind of just honeysuckles and fine textured stuff together will stand out against that and be seen from up above. But this is from having brought someone out there with the flag first. Because from the house, I have to move back toward the house and that's what I see. So here is where we were just standing and looking down the path that I showed you. And there are rocks and see the gold, they're growing up, but those are a golden elderberry that's flagging as they get older, as they grow up, flagging that area to say, come out here, come to this space and come look because then you can walk down here and follow the path all the way down into that area. Got our seven suns growing up there, getting bigger. So that's where our magnolia went, where Deb is working. And these are seven sun shrubs. Magnolia is now over there. Seven sun shrubs now just getting tall enough to be able to start seeing them from the house. So those are flags. They let you play with the height, especially from places where you're at different elevations. You can also use models. And the first time that I used models, I used stuff from the kitchen, a, a tea box, a peanut butter jar, arborvitaes, our, our jars of water, a cut out plant put in the middle of it. Since then, I've been making models that we use in classes. And some of you, I think, have used these models because we use them at least once through the Detroit Garden Center. But placing things in real life and moving them around helps a lot of people, especially gardeners, visualize because we're very tactile people. We need to move them around. So you can play around with things and say, I want something pyramidal. I want something flat. I want something gray. I want something green. I want something that's lighter green or bluer green, more mounded or more coarse. Peanut butter jar was the uh, um, bush next to the shed, the tree that goes there. And this is boiling them down just the same way that I was having you mess with your focus, boiling them down just to their basic shapes. And you can do this with Play-Doh. Uh, if you've got grandkids and you've got Play-Doh, heavens, you've probably got slime too. <sighs> slime is everywhere. And you can say, mounded in red, flat and kind of medium coarse in the lady's mantle, finer and darker green, more upright in the Baptisia. And you can make yourself a garden and say, you know, I can do that. I could do something red and then something upright and then swoop it around with shorter things that have a little more coarse texture. When you're doing this, you're, you're picking focal points. You're either picking the point that already drew your attention and maybe now you're using it as a background or you're framing what was already there. But when you pick that focal point and you decide to show it off, remember the flagpole, be comfortable with the placement um, because when you frame, when you put, make a combination of plants that has some contrast, you're gonna set off the balance you set up and balance in the middle of your field of vision tends to make us want to put the same thing on either side. You don't have to, but it wants people to put the same thing on either side. It's just kind of this, this urge that we have. Whereas if you put a focal point off to one side, there's more um, tendency to put varied things around it, asymmetrical or informal balance. So when I have a informal background nature to have a center focal point is a little bit unnatural um, and makes you want to put the same thing on either side, but to push the focal point off to one side works better. So make sure that you're, you're comfortable with the placement. We pushed Margaret's Japanese maple where we were going to put it. I pushed it not in the center of the bed, but over to one side because we wanted it to be seen as the background for a sweep of, these are hostas and Jeffersonia and trillium, things with large green, so coarser textured, mounded plants around the finer textured purple plant. At Cleveland Botanical Garden, no, sorry, sorry, Toledo, I'm very sorry, I didn't mean to do that. At the Toledo Botanical Garden, in the herb garden area, we've got a center focal point framed 
symmetrically framed symmetrically again, just the same way that you would put a mat and a frame together. And then that makes the side want to be symmetrical too. And if you want to get away from that and say, no, I'd like to have something different on either side of this, it gets a little hard to break the symmetry when you can see the two together. So make sure that you're comfortable with a, with a formal focal point if that's what you're, what you're working with. Informal is pushing it to one side. So the bench framed with a rosemary leaf boxwood and framed in its background with the oak leaf hydrangea and a climbing hydrangea. More formal setup in Rosemary Berry Garden, Rosemary Berry's Garden in the Cotswolds, uh, golden chain tree, arbor, uh, pergola leading to it, alliums on either side, same plant on either side. This is uh, um, not Tiarella, um, ah, miterwort, it's miterwort called. We'll think about that later. Telema, this telema on either side. Formal center placement symmetrically on both sides. This is a test garden, test uh, annual demonstration of this, or test garden at Michigan State University's grounds. Formal makes you want to do formal on either side. Informal, move that rabbit just a little bit to one side so I can have different things on either side in the frame. Coarse textured rhubarb, salvia, lavender, uh, lavender, salvia. The fish doesn't go right centered with the waterfall. The fish goes to one side. So you want an informal space in your sitting area because you want to plant lots of different kinds of things like Louise did. I said, Louise, that's a tricolor beach and a hemlock. She says, I can prune, honey, I can prune. I want to have different things around me. So informal placement, even pushing the table to one side makes you then be able to put um, a focal point with two different plants on either side of it. There's a holly on one side and a, a inkberry on the other side, uh, a hemlock on one side and a false cypress on the other side. Um, in the background, we were putting in a new bed into a backyard that already had a lot of things in it and looking to see whether or not the placement of the Japanese maple would work. Do we want that Japanese maple to be in the middle? Would that work all right? Or maybe actually we don't want a Japanese maple. Maybe we want to just play on the background and use another pyramid over here. No, no, we need to have a Japanese maple. I said, okay, well, if you want a Japanese maple, I think we're going to put it to one side because if you're putting that fountain there, the Japanese maple would just, in essence, hide some of the fountain. So we'll put the Japanese maple to one side. When I'm visualizing what to put someplace, I'm trying to fill the spot that's drawing my eye. And this is where you use the thumbs bit, where you say, how big an area? So I'm looking at this area and I can see from here to here, I want to have something at least this big out there. And it could be that the things you're thinking of that fit your description you've come up with are maybe too small, in which case then you put several of them there, you put a mass of them there. So you fill it with just one item or for uh, with a group of something. I can put something pyramidal in the middle. I can frame that. So you can break the you can break the habit. I can frame it symmetrically. I can frame it asymmetrically. But you have to know what you're trying to do, what look you want. Off to one side or center. And space is really nice. As gardeners, we object to having bare space. What can I put there? But space even if it's space that is simply claimed by something laying low on the ground and just changing the ground to a different color, space is nice. It gives the shape a chance to be a shape. The further up I come on the side of this pyramid, the less pyramidal it looks. The further up I come on the side of a vase, the less vase shaped it looks. So you know, if I want it to be a vase or a pyramid, give it some space. And the nice thing about these things that you've thought about putting in there is, for instance, coarse textured mound, a hosta. Hostas are, most of them, are mounds. Um, and they're rather coarse in texture. If, if I take one of them and say, okay, coarse texture, I'll indicate coarse texture by a, a ragged outline. One of them looks like that. 
a group of them, I put a group of them together, looks like that. It looks, they look, they keep, they keep their character in a group. So if I keep, I group a number of the same items together, I end up with as if it's one bigger item. You can do that with shrubs. Um, you can do that with ground covers. You can do that with perennials. You can even do that with statuary. But you do need to think about that. How much space do I need to fill? So I'm standing across the backyard here, looking at the shed. And the shed is actually an important part of the backyard, looking from the kitchen window, looking from the bedroom window. This shed is the only thing that has that character, the rectilinear character, and it's going to stay there. So it's going to be a focal point. So looking at it and kind of covering it with two thumbs, I go, I need at least two thumbs worth of something with it or maybe more than two thumbs worth of something in order to be a good companion for it. So we're standing at the same place and now the garden is in. So if you look and see, we've got these plants mounted, this mounted, these are all, and this group of plants here mounted, these are all frames or companions to that shed, which yes, we changed the color and put, put the shutters on it. The coarse, te coarse textured low and blue, this is cranberry meridima or sea kale. And not just two or three of them. It is a perennial garden and people tend to think of just two or three, but a lot of them, I think, I don't know, maybe there's 12 of them, but the idea was they needed to fill a space at least that big in order to look good with the shed. Same thing with the snowberry behind them, the symphoricarpus. We needed at least that many to look good with the shed from that far away. They're supposed to be, if the deer would leave them alone, some thalictrum over here, we're working on another tall plant because boy, they do like thalictrum or meadow rue. So they're supposed to be height over here. They're all working with the shed. And this is just a pencil on a piece of tracing paper thrown on top of the picture to show you what the lines were that I drew out that really were in a plan view, just a scoop, a scallop of, of an item, another scallop of an item, and two individual items. This is a crab apple as an upright and the upright polyptrum that we're still looking for something else for, because that's the way that we see the picture. And over on the other side, sorry, over on the other side here, as we move to another focal point, because we're looking at the, as we get closer, we're looking at the shed now separate from this area over here. This is a Japanese maple that we moved from the front yard where it just could not stay um, right next to the house. It was gonna have to be pruned regularly. So we moved it here. That's got a nice crown on it. We framed it with, I think there were five um, butterfly bushes, one of the dwarf four foot butterfly bushes. They are one mass in front of one mass. And that's what it looked like on my drawing when I was figuring out what to put across the yard. It's a big garden, it's a huge garden. It's, uh, it's easily 20 feet from the back to the front, big enough that we need paths to go through it to be able to work on it well. But you don't see that from a distance. What you see from the distance was what you put your two thumbs together and said, I need something that goes from here to there. I need something that goes from here to there. There's that path and there's those butterfly bushes. Okay, so space is nice to have at uh, the front of Sue and Jerry's house. Um, when it started, well, not quite when it started because we've already pulled out all of that fabric and stuff that was on here. Everything was in the typical kind of arrangement of new houses, they, uh, landscapers, who are responding to someone's need for it, it has to look nice right away, tend to put in a lot of shrubbery right next to the houses. Um, landscape architects do the same thing, they overplant. So these are dwarf burning bushes. Now dwarf burning bushes on here, I think there were five, five or six back here. Dwarf burning bushes allowed to grow are about as big as this Japanese maple is right now, about 10 feet tall, eight to 10 feet tall and wider than they are tall. Globe blue spruces, if allowed to grow, are 10, 15 feet across. There's one on either side of the front. Um, there are junipers and yews in the front and they also get very big. So we took them out. Um, we took out one of the globe blue spruces and moved it. 
We took out all of the ewes and moved it. We took out all of the burning bushes and moved it because we didn't need them there. We needed some space, some breathing room. So we made breathing room with a little area. Do you sit there? No, you don't sit there, but you see it from the window. You see the space here. It's planted with some painted fern and, and uh, wood poppy. And we used boxwood that we could keep cut in a, in a low hedge out here and ground cover perennials. And that's remained over the years. These are, this is winter time. Sue puts out, um, I've forgotten what, it's silk, but she's got some pots out here because she does look through that window a lot. So we went from looking at something that had something in every space to something that has space. In the wintertime, especially, space is nice. So there's our space back there. You can see a bird bath sitting back there. There it is. It sits on that open space. Until it gets to where you start saying, okay, now it's time to change it around. We did just change this whole thing. We don't have an after picture yet because it has to grow up this year to see what it does. Change the perennials. And we took those things that we moved, we use the burning bushes, and we're getting ready to put them out here because they're movable, a lot of these things. You can just throw them away if you want to throw them away, but we have the space to do something with because what's this grass really doing for us out here? So we've, uh, based on the plan that I drew, we've taken sod out of the areas where something's going to get moved. Trees can go here, blue globe spruce is gonna go there. These are gonna be ewes, those are gonna be roses. And we take the sod that we're taking out of other areas and we're stacking it upside down to make a raised bed. But the areas where the plants are going, we're not putting grass in there. We want them to, to live, not have grass growing up through them. And we moved the ewes out here and moved the blue spruce out there. This is right away. Got a little rock wall to hold the raised bed up. Here's the burning bushes that we moved from the front. And along the front with brick going all the way down to the bottom, we didn't need anything. We have peonies there, uh, one hydrangea and then the boxwood hedge. The rest is color, it frames the hydrangea, it frames as you come around the corner, that frames the peonies. Even in the winter time, you don't need anything there. If you do need something there, we've just put something I don't have an after picture here. We put sculptures there. Each peony has a sculpture that's made to look like a bush, kind of slate, slate gray uh, metal sculpture that the peony grows up through and it holds them, ho helps hold the peony up. But the sculpture itself can stay there the whole year so that there is something there in the wintertime. I'll have to show you those pictures in the spring because I forgot to take a picture when we dropped them off there. Uh, so things grow in then new tree, but the blue spruce is there, little sergeant crab apples, new tree over with the burning bushes and ground cover. And most of it populated with plants that we can now let grow that could never get that big back where they'd started from. You get brave enough to do it because you stand back with the picture and you say, what if I took that bush and put it out here? That could work. And I got to move it over further here because I don't really want to block my front front door view, that's how you work it out. And just keep thinking in terms of the notable characteristics. Try not to think in terms of names of plants. Think coarse, upright, purple coneflower. Think finer texture, upright, flag iris. There's that penstem and husker right again. So I was only thinking back at another Sue's house and now I'm walking down the road toward her house and well, I mean, the house itself is, is attractive, but could we have something nicer to look at? Could we put in some pyramids and some mounds, some coarser texture and some finer texture in here? And we did. We put in sun-kissed arborvitae in a big bed, uh, calicanthus, sweet shrub, nine bark is behind here, and on the side, lindira. And they're growing up. So I said, oh, look how they've grown. I said, oh, well, you might, might be able to tell that the tree is being limbed up as it grows because there's a little sassafras under here. And back here is a yellowwood tree. Look again, see the yellowwood tree now growing up. 
access for us is also going up and we're taking branches out because these are quite decrepit trees. They really don't need to be there, but Sue enjoys the birds as much as we do. And for a while until this one grows and this one grows and these grow, there it's gonna take a while. And now is really the great time to do it. It's late fall or early spring. If you try to do this during the, gar the growing season, as a gardener, it is so hard to imagine moving all that stuff or changing that stuff around. It's easier to look at it when it's flat and, and relatively bare. Take the bed when things are just beginning to come up and your notes say fall or early spring. It should say fall to early spring. That's the time to do it. Because once things are up, you just feel like you can't do anything and you can, you can do anything. Um, as much as I liked this combination of the, the big miscanthus, that's miscanthus giganteus and uh, an Alnopochki aster and coniclinum uh, perennial ageratum and sedum and euphorbia, I like this together. But when they can't talk back to you, when you can say, you, you're out of here, that's the time that you really want to work on stuff like that where you can look out there at the snow and draw some lines in the snow and say, hmm, what if I do this? Bring these areas over here. That, that could work pretty well. And you can walk around your different windows and look at your lines that you did in the snow and say, that's what we're gonna do in the yard. So time for questions again. Uh-oh, I'm gonna to have to hurry on the last part here. So are there any questions? Yeah, I have a couple. One, I wanna make a comment. Um, one of your classes, uh, Steve mentioned that when you're planning a plot using Google Maps, if you make a copy of your property, you it's, can outline a trace it so you get the whole it view is, of your house, your garage, whatever's on your property. It, it is, and, and it's all to scale. Um, yes, I, it, it's, it is, it's wonderful to do that. I think I have a picture of one of those coming up in this last part. Okay. Uh, then some of the questions, um, is there, what design software can you recommend? I, I can't recommend any design software. There are some that that can help you picture. One was called 3D Landscape, 3D Flower Garden. Um, I played around with those for a while when we had our, our school of gardening. But um, I, I can't recommend that they're going to help you design any more than cutting out pictures are going to do because it's basically what they do. They and most of them, in terms of actual design, do not do a design for you. They're just drafting tools. Uh, you can play around with with pictures and sliding pictures around, perhaps easier. And some of them, like those landscape design, there's another one called uh, Landscape Architect and Flower Garden Planner. Um, they have a library, so they have a bunch of pictures ready for you to move around. You don't have to go find a picture and cut anything out, uh, but. I'd have to look again and see if those are still, I'm sure they still are because they were fun toys to play with, but um, they don't help you any more than moving around yourself. Yeah. Um, someone suggested they use, they use PowerPoint and they can insert the photo and then yeah, yeah. all shapes on it, whatever. Yeah, PowerPoint is easy to move things around uh, and you can scan in pictures. If you've got Photoshop elements, you can cut out the picture, but sometimes you can't cut out the picture very well in, uh, in PowerPoint or a keynote. And then um, someone wants to know if you use a photo, how do you um, visualize the scale to get the right scale of what you're drawing? To the... Well, if you have a photo, the scale is there for you. You see how big the house is. And all you're doing is saying, that's my background. What can I put in front of it? And you put something in front of it. And now it tells you, I need something as tall as the window. This is where a flag can come in handy where you say, okay, I was thinking about putting that on the lawn. How tall does that flag have to be to be just level with that window or however it is that I pictured it? Um, your, your scale doesn't matter. It's relative when you have a picture. You have a picture that says this thing has to be placed so that it's in front of the window, but not hiding the upstairs window or so that it's next to the door and not covering the door. So you actually see on the picture how big it is, and then you can go out in life and stick a flag out there and take it from there or have your kids stand out there with their hands spread and say, how, how big does it have to be? The best I can do for you for the scale problem. Um, the, um, when you were working on that one site was in the other was wooded area, they went off you removed the invasive autumn yeah. and the honeysuckle. 
Well, we took all the Ottawa olive and honeysuckle out of our area, but that doesn't mean that the adjacent properties took all theirs out. So uh, <laughs> continual, continual problem. One one neighbor did um, has signed on and is starting to help get rid of garden chemistry, for instance. So it's an education process for people have to give by. And, and uh, it's been it's been interesting that in most cases when there is that kind of problem uh, across the property line that if you say, can I come and clear that out? A lot of times people say, sure, you can do that. But the neighbor down the slope uh, was very adamant that we had to leave everything alone on his side. So it'll take a while to work there. Okay. Um, which hazel, what's an ideal growing condition and do they grow in moist and wet soils? Um, not wet soils, not for a witch hazel. Witch hazel appreciates moisture, but not not soggy soil. Um, and the best the best exposure for a witch hazel to bloom really well is to be under high shade, so high branch trees like those black cherries and oaks that you saw them under, or in a place where they've got uh, sun all morning and shade all afternoon because they, they do have leaves that can get scorched when they're first coming out in the springtime. And you wanna have that, um, some protection that kind of keeps the scent in. The, the scent is wonderful, but it, it can float away in no time at all. And then um, someone talked about how do you protect plants from the deer population? <laughs> uh, I I uh, I don't have, I don't think I have pictures today of that, but we put um, we put stakes, tall stakes. Um, we use the uh, the wood that's used as as a what's it called lath strips. Um, they're one inch wide by half an inch. Uh, deep eight foot stakes and we pound those in the ground usually six or eight of them around in a circle around the plant and then we rope around it at a height that makes it difficult for a buck to get its antlers through and get a good run at the, at the plant and then if it's something that they like to eat use a repellent but we try to find things that they don't like to eat and all we're trying to do is protect them from rubbing them to death um, and we can make this look quite attractive when we use we use jute rope just hemp rope that we go around and around the stakes and do a crisscross pad. And I, I don't have any pictures of those today. Botanical gardens, go and look in botanical gardens. They use a, a PVC pipe that they split down one side and put it around the trunk so that the trunk can't get rat, um, scraped up. Or they use heavy metal stakes and, and wire mesh around. They're not thinking about trying to keep it looking pretty. They're trying to keep it alive until it gets big enough to handle the, any damage that it might get. And that's just that's just reality. It's it's gonna have to, it's gonna someday it'll look out for itself. You're trying to look out for it for five or six or maybe as much as 10 years. Someone wants to know what the plant is that you're standing under. I think they're it's arrows. Gun, it's gunnera. Uh gunnera is um gunnera, it might be gigantium. That's not not hardy in I think I think it's a zone seven would be as hard as, and even in zone seven, they would protect the crowns in the winter time. But uh, you see it a lot in, in English gardens and French gardens in wet areas. Okay, let's move on to, uh, let's make sure that I can get through to the, the last chapter because that's all for, that I put into chapter two for visualizing change in the garden and landscape and we'll move on into the third chapter. 